Today we're going to talk about our second part of conservation of energy lesson. So let's start by reviewing the basic energy model as an equation. If the system is isolated and there's no work being done by the environment or on the environment, then we know that the total energy of the system remains constant. If it's not completely isolated, then the change in the energy of the system is equal to the work done by or on the environment. So let's refresh ourselves on what work is. Work is a transfer of mechanical energy in or out of a system because of a force. But is a force all that's needed to have work done? To answer that, let's consider this example. An object is at rest under the action of two forces, the Earth's gravitational force or weight and a normal force exerted by the table. In this scenario, does the kinetic energy of that box of that system increase? If it's not moving, the kinetic energy can't change. So therefore, we need to have movement or a displacement in order for work to be done. So here's a box which undergoes a displacement. So under the action of that pull force, the object moves to the right. So of those three forces acting on the box, which one actually contributes to the kinetic energy increase of the system? It's just the pull force. The normal force and the weight don't contribute to the energy change. In our final example here, let's have the pull force be at an upward angle. The vertical component of the pull force acts to reduce the magnitude of the normal force so that there's no acceleration in the y direction. And the horizontal component is what produces the acceleration and the change in kinetic energy. So for work to be done, there must be a force acting from outside the system. That force must create a displacement. And only the component of the force parallel to the displacement actually contributes to the energy change of the system. So here's those three observations turned into an equation. So our work is going to be the product of the magnitude of the force, the magnitude of the displacement d, and the cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement vectors. That angle is not the direction of the force or the direction of the displacement vector, but is the angle between those two things in the plane they define. In the case of two where the force and displacement are parallel, that angle is zero. In the case where they are in opposite directions, that angle is 180 degrees. And of course, if they're perpendicular, that's 90. So with this equation, we can determine what the unit would be for energy. Work is the transfer of energy, so it has the same units as energy. So we have that the work is equal to the product of force units and displacement units, a newton meter. That's given the derived unit name of joule. It's named after an English scientist who helped develop the idea of energy conservation. So when the angle between the force and the displacement vectors is acute, that means we'll have a positive work and energy will flow into the system. The total energy of the system will therefore increase. If we have an obtuse angle greater than 90 degrees, since cosine is negative in the second quadrant, that means we end up with a negative work. That means the total energy of the system decreases and energy is transferred to the environment from the system. And when the force and the displacement are perpendicular, there is no energy transfer. No work is being done. Once we have 
an equation that calculates the quantity of work created by a force and the energy change in a system. Therefore, we can use this in Newton's second law and kinematics equations to derive an expression for the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Notice that it's a quadratic relationship. If you double the speed of an object, you're actually quadrupling its kinetic energy. The derivation of this is presented in your textbook. I'm not going to go through it here in this lesson. Interesting historical sidelight. In addition to arguing over who invented calculus, Newton and Leibniz also argued over what the proper form was for what we today call kinetic energy. Newton thought it should be proportional to V. Leibniz thought it should be proportional to V squared. A Dutch scientist named Williams Gravesson did a very famous and uh, clever experiment that showed that Leibniz was closer to being correct. That the kinetic energy was proportional to V squared. He did this by dropping um, metal weights into tubs of soft clay. His rationale was that the depth of the dent made in the clay would be related to the energy. Kinematics tells us that if you drop something from rest at a height h, then the speed of impact is going to be proportional to the square root of h. So if Newton was right, the depth of the dent in the clay would be proportional to the square root of h. If Leibniz was right, it would be proportional to h, the square root squared. He did the experiment carefully, and it turns out that Leibniz was closer to right. The factor of one half that Leibniz missed was actually comes from calculus and from doing an integral and, or an antiderivative. All right, let's turn our attention to mathematical expressions for potential energy. We talk about potential energy instead of work when the agent is a part of the system. So for example, in gravity, the system consists of the Earth and the object. Earth is the agent. So we talk about a potential energy rather than the work for that. But potential energy is related to work. So if you consider an object in free fall, as it falls downward, its kinetic energy increases. Therefore, its potential energy must be decreasing. That means we also know that from our FD cosine phi expression, gravity is pointing downward, the displacement is pointing downward, so we end up with a positive work. So gravity does positive work on the way down while the potential energy is decreasing. So what that suggests is that when we have this kind of internal conservative force, the change in potential energy associated with that force will be the opposite of the work done by it. So if an object moves with a downward displacement of delta y, we can calculate the work as mg delta y. If it moves upwards, our work is minus mg delta y. So what that suggests is that the expression for the potential energy due to gravity, at least near the surface of the Earth, is just mg times y. Where do we measure y from? Does it have to be from sea level? Does it have to be from the floor level? Does it have to be from the center of the Earth? It actually does not matter because our conservation of energy equation is only based on differences in potential energy. So since the function is linear, it doesn't matter where we measure from, the delta will always be the same. A good rule of thumb is to make your y equal zero level the lowest height, the lowest y-coordinate experienced by the moving part of your system. A similar analysis can be done using Hooke's Law to determine what the potential energy of a stretched or compressed spring would be. However, because the force is variable with displacement, this requires calculus, so I'm just going to give you the expression here. So the potential energy of a stretched or compressed spring is one-half the spring constant times the stretch or compression squared. 
So delta x in this case represents the change in length of the spring. Notice that we get positive potential energy for both a negative delta x and a positive delta x because of the quadratic nature. So let's return to our basic energy model. We can now use this as a problem solving strategy because we know how to write expressions for delta k, delta u, and work. So here's an example problem that we can solve this way. A child is going down a frictionless water slide. This is not a good problem to solve with kinematics because the forces and the acceleration will not be constant. So as the child moves along the curved surface, the normal force is continuously changing direction. Sometimes it's more parallel to the uh, it's so our our force and our acceleration are going to be non-uniform. So let's try to solve it using conservation of energy. Let's set our y equals zero level at the bottom of the water slide. This is where we would like to calculate the speed of the child, and so that's a good place to use as our reference level. So as they move down the slide, the potential energy is going to decrease by an amount minus mgh negative because the movement is downwards. Our kinetic energy change goes from 0 to 1 half mv squared. So our delta k is plus 1 half mv squared. There's no friction and the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement at all times so there's no work being done by or on the environment. So if I substitute those into the basic energy model equation, delta K plus delta U, there's no chemical, nuclear, or thermal energy changes. So all of those delta E's add up to the work, which is zero. And then it's a one-step algebra solution to show that the speed is the square root of 2GH at the bottom. There are some more complicated and advanced sample problems in your text for you to study before you begin your homework. For a five-point bonus assignment, email me the color of the boxes on the work slides.